Hi, I'm Michelle Levitt. I'm the marketing director at Heil Sound. I've been working for Heil Sound for 16 years, and before that, I was a musician. So I've been using microphones in all sorts of applications for about 25 years. I'm also a podcaster. I've worked on every aspect of a podcast, from producing to editing and hosting. I had my own podcasting studio and consulting business, and I have helped countless podcasters start their podcasts. One of the biggest hurdles that all of these new podcasters faced was the microphone. Understanding the mic, how to sound good, and how to be comfortable behind the mic. My goal today is to give you the tools to approach your mic with confidence. We're going to go over two different types of microphones, dynamic and condenser. We'll cover sound treatment and what you need. We'll talk about element placement, essentially where the element is in the housing. We'll go over polar patterns and their implications. Rear rejection and why it really matters. We'll cover frequency response and EQ. Of course, we'll talk about gain. Spoiler alert, it's not a volume knob. And lastly, we'll go over some microphone tips and techniques to get you the best sound. Side note, if you already own a microphone and aren't sure how all these topics relate to your current microphone, please reference your owner's manual for that information. Since we've got a lot to cover, let's get started with one of the most frequently asked questions we get at podcast shows. Which type of microphone is right for me? Dynamics or condensers? When deciding on the right microphone for your podcasting needs, there are a lot of things to consider, but one of the first questions you should be asking is, should I get a condenser or a dynamic microphone? These terms refer to the type of microphone element. The element is the cartridge inside the microphone that picks up sound. You can't generally tell by looking at the outside of a microphone if it's a dynamic or condenser, but they are very different. Dynamic elements are made of a synthetic membrane diaphragm and are connected to a coil of very thin wire that is suspended in a strong magnetic field. As the sound waves hit the diaphragm, the coil of wire vibrates in the magnetic field, causing an electrical signal to be produced. If you've ever taken the cover off of a speaker cabinet, you will see an example of essentially a dynamic microphone, but in reverse. A speaker takes a signal and turns it into audio, whereas a dynamic element takes audio and turns it into a signal. Dynamic microphones are durable, can handle loud audio sources, they do not need a power source, we'll talk more about that in a moment, and you generally don't need to soundproof a room to use one, because they don't pick up as much ambient noise. Applications for dynamic microphones are really just about anywhere, they're a jack of all trades, and they are typically the choice of professional broadcast studios. Condenser microphones have an element that is made up of a thin film coated with a conductive metallic material, which is suspended over a polarized, powered backplate. This condenser diaphragm is part of an electrical circuit that changes voltage with movement, and this voltage becomes the output of the microphone. A condenser plate is a flat surface and is designed to pick up everything in a very detailed way. Applications are anywhere you need highly detailed sound and have a soundproof space. A soundproof space is critical to achieving good clean audio with a condenser. Condensers should not be considered unless you are going to soundproof your space. It's also not a good idea to try to use more than one condenser mic in the same room to record a podcast. Condensers are designed to pick up virtually everything. That means unless you really know what you're doing, there will be audio bleed from one mic to another. Bleed is when the other person's audio ends up in your microphone's recording. I will touch more on the implications of this later. Condensers also need a power source. This isn't a separate power supply or anything like that. This power source is called phantom power. Phantom power delivers 48 volts through the mic cable to the microphone. A mixer, an interface, or even a computer in the case of some USB mics will provide this power. Since we're talking about condensers, let's talk about various kinds of sound treatment. Sound waves like smooth, flat surfaces to bounce off of, and depending on the environment you are in and the sensitivity of your microphone, you will probably need some kind of sound treatment. This is a soundproof room. If you're going to be using a condenser mic, then this is the ideal environment. I have done professional voiceover in a room like this with a very nice, very expensive condenser mic. I definitely don't have the budget to do something like this for myself, but if you do, then more power to you. Remember how we talked about bleed? It is for this reason that you can only record one person at a time in a room like this with a microphone like this. This is an incredible example of sound diffusion. This is Blackbird Studio in Nashville, and this is obviously a professional studio. Sound diffusion is a series of uneven surfaces that break up sound waves. A DIY version would be sitting in front of a bookshelf at home that has various depths of books and openings. 
Any sound that would have bounced off the flat wall and directly into the business end of the microphone is being deflected in different directions. Sound dampening can range from moving blankets hung on the wall to something like this. This is a picture of my former podcast studio in Buffalo, New York. See that cool black and white picture? It's actually sound dampening fabric that was printed with drone photography of the city. I had this made by a local print shop using special sound dampening fabric. The studio was a small space, essentially an office. It had acoustic drop panels for the ceiling, carpet, and thin walls. We regularly had three to five people in the studio at a time, and we generally spoke across the table from one another. And the sound could start to bounce around the room and into the microphones. So I came up with this solution. Any sound dampening or diffusion you can add behind the business end of the microphone will ultimately help your audio sound good. And by the way, don't do this. Anyone who tells you to put a blanket over your head to record an hour-long podcast is not your friend. This is ridiculous. If you need this to make your microphone sound good, you have the wrong type of microphone for your application. This guy is most likely using a condenser in a less than ideal space. Speaking of the business end of the microphone, let's talk element placement. Microphone element placement plays a critical role when talking about polar patterns. You can't know where your polar pattern is or how it behaves if you don't know where the microphone element is. There are two types of element placement, in-fire or side address. An in-fire element captures audio from the end of the microphone. People always ask me what kind of microphone I use. This is the PR30 and this is the microphone that I'm using today. A side address element captures audio from the side of the microphone. So now that you know about element placement, we can talk about polar patterns. Every microphone has a polar pattern. This is a polar pattern chart that you might find on a manufacturer's website. So what are they? The polar pattern determines how a microphone will pick up audio. This matters because depending on how you intend to use the microphone, the polar pattern can help or hurt your audio. The polar pattern is the area around the microphone element that will capture audio. Note that at the top there is a zero. This zero represents talking straight into the mic element, or what we call on axis. And 180 degrees represents the very back of the microphone. You will hear people talk about the rejection of a microphone at 180 degrees off axis. This is what that's referring to. Anytime you get further away from zero, you are further off axis. We will talk more about rear rejection later. So now you can see why it's important that you know where the microphone element is housed inside the body of the microphone. Let's look at an example. This is the PR40. The PR40 is an in-fire element. If we could see through the PR40, it would look like this and we could see that the element is way up close to the end grill. To understand polar pattern diagrams, we start at the end of the element. There are different types of polar patterns and the types of polar patterns dictate their application. This is the polar pattern that we saw before. This particular microphone has a cardioid polar pattern. That means it picks up audio out of the end of the microphone element and slightly off axis, but it does not pick up sound out of the sides or back of the microphone. These are really ideal for podcasters. They're very directional and exhibit great rear rejection, so you don't have to soundproof a room to use them. I'll talk more about rear rejection in a moment. The supercardioid is going to have the same application suggestions as a cardioid. It is actually more directional and picks up less audio from the sides, but you have to be aware that it can pick up some audio out of the back of the microphone. Omnidirectional polar patterns pick up audio all around the microphone very evenly. You typically see these used for in-the-field journalism. They are ideal for this application because they can be pointed at an audio source without much attention being paid to exact mic placement. These are not great if you will be recording at a desk. They will pick up every paper shuffle or keyboard click. If you are using a lapel mic, it is most likely an omnidirectional mic. If you have ever used one of these mics, you will know that it is not good for recording more than one person for a podcast because you are just going to end up with a lot of noise in the mix. Bidirectional polar patterns can be used to record more than one audio source at once, but they are very directional. So you have to carefully place the microphone and don't move. I know what I just said sounds very tempting if you're doing a podcast with a guest or co-host. The problem with using a bi-directional mic to record two podcasters is that you have a single audio track and you can't edit volume levels or remove noise from the non-speaking podcaster. You really need one microphone per person being recorded and you need to record each of those people in their own audio track. That way, when your co-host sneezes into their microphone while you are saying the most brilliant thing you've ever said... You can just cut them out. Now that you understand how the microphone picks up audio, let's talk about what it doesn't pick up. By the way, this concept really only applies to dynamic microphones. Reality, here is my Wizard of Oz moment. You saw my old podcast studio a few moments ago. 
These days, I work in an office space, probably very similar to what most people have. The reason I recommend dynamic cardioid and supercardioid microphones to most podcasters is because of their rear noise rejection. Rear noise rejection refers to a microphone's ability to reject other audio signals outside of its polar pattern. Most of us don't have the resources to have a soundproof studio. The reality is, most of you are like me, and recording at home or in an office somewhere. We have pets, we have kids, we have roommates, or we have neighbors who mow their grass five times a week. No matter what environment you are in, rear noise rejection will keep your mic from picking up your co-hosts, keyboards, or papers shuffling. I also once recorded a podcast on the trade show floor of the NAMM show, the largest trade show in the music industry that has over 100,000 attendees, and it sounded great. The reason I'm able to record in these unforgiving environments is because I use dynamic microphones that exhibit great rear rejection. This would not be possible with a condenser. Think back to the image with the guy with the rug over his head. Okay, so now that you understand where a microphone picks up audio and where it doesn't pick up audio, let's talk about how that audio sounds and the frequency response of a microphone. This is a frequency response chart. Frequency response is the range of sound that a microphone can reproduce. Each microphone has its own unique frequency response, and it is that frequency response that affects how the microphone will sound on any given person. People sometimes make a bigger deal out of this than what it is. What you really need to pay attention to in a frequency response is the two to five kilohertz range between the red bars, which is roughly where the human voice is most articulate, and you want to see a rise in the response in this area. This will mean that the microphone will have an articulate, natural sound on the human voice. If you don't like how your voice sounds on your microphone, that's where some thoughtful equalization can help. Using equalization controls on an outboard mixer or in your digital audio workspace, you can adjust the EQ of your microphone. If you want your audio to be warmer, then increase the low frequencies. Conversely, if your audio is muddy, decrease your lower frequencies. If you need more articulation in your sound, increase the mid-range frequencies, and if your audio sounds too nasally, decrease them. If you want more presence to your sound, increase the highs, and if the sound is too harsh, decrease the highs. These can also be used in combination to really dial in your sound. By the way, I'm not using any EQ on my microphone. If you find the right microphone for your voice, you should not need EQ or extra processing. And that leads us to gain. Gain is a common issue that comes up with podcasters. Most interfaces, mixers, and some USB mics have a gain control on it. Most podcasters turn up the gain when what they really want is volume. I can't stress this enough. Gain is not volume. I'm going to say that again. Gain is not volume. As you can see on this mixer, gain, the red arrow, is different from the channel volume, the blue arrow, which is also different from the master volume, the green arrow. Simply put, gain is the control of the microphone's input level. That is the strength of your microphone's signal. Volume is the control of the microphone's output level, or what podcasters want with perceived loudness. Increasing the volume too much simply makes your sound louder. However, increasing the gain too much at best makes your audio noisy and at worst overdrive the mic, causing distortion, cracking sound, and a high-pitched feedback. It's best to keep your gain levels around 50 to 60% as a starting point and adjust very slightly from there as needed. If you're using a mixer like the one pictured, you can just adjust your channel or master volume. If you're using an interface or a USB mic, those tend to only have outboard gain controls and to change volume, you will need to do it in your DAW or computer. Too often, podcasters increase gain not only for volume, but to compensate for improper microphone technique because they're way too far away from the mic, which I'll explain in more detail later. One of the most common questions that beginner podcasters are pondering is if they should use an XLR mic or a USB mic. A common thing I hear from podcasters is that they have a USB mic with no other information about it. As we've talked about, there are multiple types of mics and mic features. It's better to talk about mics as what kind they are first, for example, dynamic or condenser, because the output connection doesn't necessarily tell someone what a mic can or cannot do. However, the mic connection type is still important because of their different implications. There are two basic output connections for microphones for podcasting. First is the three pin XLR connector. This is the industry standard for professional microphones. They produce an analog signal that requires either an adapter, a mixer, or an interface to convert that analog signal to digital to be used with your computer. On the point of interfaces, most interfaces and USB mixers have built-in preamps that should be sufficient to drive most well-designed mics without any additional preamp or processing. 
This issue typically applies only to dynamic mics since condensers are powered through phantom power mentioned earlier. The second output connection is USB. These plug straight into your computer and they are already a digital signal. As a generalization, USB mics are more often condensers rather than dynamics and are typically entry level to intermediate level products. This last section is maybe the most important. Good mic technique will solve a lot of your problems. Unless your product manual specifically tells you to not talk directly into your mic, these tips are going to be universal. First, talk two finger widths away from the grill of your mic. I know that's close. I like to use a pop filter to teach people what this looks like and feels like. Put your nose on the pop filter and don't take it off. Pop filters are a good tool if you tend to be a plosive speaker, meaning you poof air out when you say things like the letter P. I do that. And I'm also a loud nose breather, which is kind of embarrassing and gets worse if I get nervous. You want to talk into the mic slightly off axis. Don't move outside your polar pattern or the sound of the microphone will start to degrade. And the number one tip to your best microphone sound, monitor your audio. Monitoring your audio in some way that you can hear yourself when you're recording. Wear headphones if you can, get good studio quality headphones. If you can't, at least wear earbuds. You can't know if you're too far off axis if you can't hear yourself. You won't know if your audio isn't good until after the fact and no post-production person wants to hear. You can fix that, right? Lastly, stand up or sit up straight and don't yell into your microphone. Speak softly. You're not actually talking across the table to your co-host, you're just talking to your microphone. To recap, we've covered a lot of microphone concepts that you had probably heard before and hopefully now you understand. Many of these topics can go much deeper, but I hope this has at least given you the building blocks for great audio for your podcast. I like to tell people that a microphone is the tool for good audio and you have to have the right tool for the job. A screwdriver is a great tool, unless what you need is a hammer. So get the right kind of microphone and use it in the right way and you won't ever have to worry about your audio again. For more information on podcasting and Heilsound microphones, visit heilsound.com slash microphones 101.